Thanks for that. So we will look a little, little bit at uh, the different aspects of the market we're tracking, uh, the supply side, uh, the product market, a uh, little bit of comments on refining as well. Um, and and uh, yeah, yeah, inventories uh, as well. And then we will conclude uh, with the shipping uh, industry or the, the impact on the, on the shipping market. Now, now let, let me start with a couple of comments on uh, crude inventories. Uh, our latest uh, product in the uh, uh, in, in our portfolio. Um, what you see here on the left-hand chart is uh, the crude inventories uh, uh, split into China in the yellow line, and blue is the rest of the world. Uh, an interesting detail here, I think, is that actually these two lines move pretty similar. Yeah? So uh, a lot of people, I think, would think otherwise that China is potentially doing some strange things differently than the rest of the world. That is not really true. On the right-hand chart, we see a typical trading hubs, uh, Northeast Europe, the MET, uh, then we have um, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, what you can see here is basically the, the development relative to late 2019. Uh, and you see the big uh, increase that was particularly happening in, Ch in China, Northeast Asia, in the yellow line, and uh, in um, the Americas as well, that is the light blue line. But if you look at the development at the very end of that line, you see that all these markets are below the late 2019 levels. So the situation we have right now is simply one where stocks are very Low. And, and I think we have strong indications that in many cases we are basically close to the operational minimum. If you look at extremely strong recordation in the market, uh, then that is one indication. Uh, and it is interesting to see that at this time of extremely strong recordation, we see building stocks uh, in quite some uh, instances or at least basically the decline except for the Americas uh, stopping. Uh, recently. So that is, I think, underpinning this idea uh, that stocks um, have come to very close to an operational minimum level. And uh, what is important about this is that it basically changes the market dynamics. Uh, it's, it, it may very well be that the relationship with market structure doesn't work anymore from here onwards, because if you're at a level where you basically cannot draw anymore, it doesn't matter what the structure is telling you. Um, yeah. yeah, then, then um, what, what is, is uh, so fascinating, fascinating about this inventory data, we can often have 112 uh, countries, is that it gives so much additional insights to the standard uh, coverage you have. In the dark blue area down here, you have those countries that are regularly covered by Jody data uh, and how much volume that accounts for in terms of food inventories. The yellow one is those that are covered by Jody data but not consistently. And all the rest, basically, this light blue area is countries where you don't have any data easily available from any uh, type of public sources. And you can see that we cover more stocks in those markets than we do in the well established ones. Yeah? And uh, the well established, of course, include the US and all the European countries and so on. So I think it's pretty striking to see how many stocks there are in countries like uh, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, uh, um, and yeah, so many other uh, places. The other interesting thing about this inventory data is that in different flow data or demand data, it is so difficult to benchmark it. it, to benchmark it. And the reason is simply, I mean, there are a number of reasons. One reason is it's simply uh, a, a point in time data set. And so basically, depending on when exactly you, the inventory is supposed to be measured, uh, whether VLCC has just unloaded or not, uh, you can have huge fluctuations. Uh, the flow data, you usually take a monthly average and that average is out. What we can see on the chart on the right hand is that um, this data is, um, yeah, that basically if we take UK here as an example, um, and if we look, there is an official data from the, you know, we've got the grid, 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 something like this, uh, from, from a government entity. Uh, then there is data from IE and uh, Jody that is supposedly reported from national entities, but it is different. Um, and then there is our data. Our data is uh, high up. Uh, then there comes the official data from the government body, and then there comes the Jody data. And interestingly enough, the Jody data showing the yellow line uh, is essentially pretty similar to the level we have at storage at refineries. Um, and the gap between our data and the Jody data, that's the purple line, that is pretty similar to the data that comes from the oil producing areas, Salvo, Flotta, and so on. Uh, so it looks very much that this data is not covered by official data. So that uh, gives you an indication of the additional insights you can do with it. Now, moving on uh, to crude supply. 
Um, our storylines have been for many months that the market is really running into, running into shortages. And where comes this story from? That's simply from the observation that there is not much more oil coming out of other countries. And if we look um, at the channel to start perhaps with the bigger picture, uh, we have here on the left hand chart exports in December all about the world by different markets. Um, and you can see here how basically this is December 21, uh, December 20, how much less exports basically have materialized in these two years compared to the previous uh, December's uh, end of the years. Uh, so not much has come back basically in December 21 versus December 20. Uh, and there are so many markets that have lost a lot of supply. So for example, Africa here in the middle in the yellow bar has lost 2 million barrels per day of exports over the last two years. Uh, all the other Americas have lost uh, 1.3 million barrels per year over the last three years. And other markets have also lost supply. And the Middle East actually, as you can see, there's a big problem blue at the beginning. Uh, they're actually also exporting less than this before. Partly that's due to the refineries uh, have started up, but even more so it's due to countries. Of course, there is Iran as well, but also some other countries like Kuwait, for example, is in a steady decline in terms of production for many years already. The right hand chart shows the exports um, of the, the components from the OPEC Plus group uh, over the last two full months, January and December versus the 2018 average. And you can see that pretty much everybody is exporting less than in 2018. That includes even Saudi Arabia in the very first bar. Only the UAE is exporting more. And on the percentage terms, uh, yeah, Iran, Libya, and Venezuela, of course, you know about the stories, but it's important. These countries export 60% less than just uh, three, uh, four years ago in 2018. Yeah, so that's a lot of oil that is being lost in Africa in the middle. Uh, is also down about 25% uh, in just um, these um, uh, four years. Now, now looking a little bit more uh, on a trend basis, um, let's start with the right hand chart. There you can see how this monthly additions uh, in terms of exports are uh, comparing to the red line, and that would be the monthly addition in terms of supply according to the official OPEC path. So you can see that basically ever since uh, April last year, uh, these additions were always falling back uh, versus the official targets. But what is particularly striking, if you look uh, basically in October, there's been a big uh, jump higher, both from uh, the core country Saudi Arabia, UAE, but also from Russia, has, has brought in back some production. But essentially, ever since then, uh, there is no additional supplies coming from these countries. Yeah, and that's a big message. I mean, we are now in February, uh, and ever since October, there isn't really coming additional supply from the core. OPEC countries. And ultimately, um, <clears throat> there is only one conclusion, in my opinion, you can draw from that, and that is that these countries actually don't have any spare capacity. Well, they have very limited spare capacity, they are not willing to use it yet. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a very big mess for the market. On the left hand chart, in the yellow line, you see the OPEC plus, uh, those with a production target, how their output has developed. Uh, and you can see nicely how they have increased, as I said, in October. Uh, but, but you, you also see where they stand. stand. Yeah, yeah, so, so there's still some 2 million barrels per day below the exports they had uh, before the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, and I put this on one chart here with US exports, that's the blue bars. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of talk about the shale industry coming back and the strong come back and so on. But the point is, if you put the 1 million barrels per day addition on this chart, that would be something like this, yeah. Uh, you can somehow deduct that even if they add on the amount of exports, it doesn't necessarily make a big difference because the big difference ultimately comes from the OPEC. Now, um, yeah, let me say one final word on that. Um, so the, the, the conclusion is that there is a strong case of very limited uh, spare capacity. The important thing about the Dapsin business is that basically that is a hard stop. Yeah? So nobody yeah, can draw more oil out of the ground within weeks or months. Yeah? It's simply not possible. And the cushion you normally have is the inventories. Yeah? But what we have seen in the first slide is that it looks like the operational minimum. Yeah? So basically, we may, yeah, yeah, probably, probably not, not yet fully, fully because Saudi Arabia has probably still some capacity, capacity, but we are basically running against the hard wall. wall. Yeah, there is no negotiation leeway. Uh, and that's important because that means that if there is more demand than supply, then ultimately prices need to rise to a level, not where supply comes in, but where demand is basically eliminated. 
Yeah, that's at least in the short term, the only outcome or the only solution for the oil supply side story. Now, a couple of comments on demand. Um, we'll keep this a little bit quicker. On the left hand chart, we see fewer imports into selected countries, some uh, eight countries, and you can see the two strong bars at the end. Um, that is a pretty strong indication that uh, something is going on in terms of power, uh, power generation there. Uh, so we're living in this very uh, type of funny world uh, from the perspective of just a couple of months or years back where there is substitution from gas to oil. Yeah, you know about probably the power shortage is more general in the market. Um, and uh, at this point of time, we have actually additional demand for oil for power generation. Um, yeah, right that chart uh, shows a little bit the importance of Russia in terms of fuel oil. Um, yeah, of course, Russia is also a big element uh, in the market uh, up there. Uh, if there were any loss of supply from Russia from here on, uh, we are in a completely uncharted territory. Yeah? So, I mean, that really would have very drastic consequences. I personally don't think it will happen, but of course, uh, it's something that can't be really forecasted. Now, what is very important is um, if we look at the supply development, last year, uh, supply has been about 2 million barrels per day below demand. Yeah? So actually the supply was less than it should have been. That's why we have the stock jobs. Now demand this year is expected to increase further. Yeah? Some people are saying 3 million barrels per day, others 4 million barrels per day, whatever. Um, uh, clear candidates for that are jet fuels. On the left hand side, we see jet inputs all around the world. And you can see that actually, what are they going up? They have gone down recently. A mixture of seasonal factors plus the Omicron wave. Uh, but there is uh, poorly in chat, quite some upside potential, perhaps something like 600,000 barrels per day plus. Uh, on the other hand, what is interesting to see here is that imports of NAFTA in the Atlantic Basin and Pacific Basin, the two lines here, have trended down over recent months. And uh, that could be or is interesting um, because NAFTA is usually seen as an early indicator for economic activity and economic growth. Yeah? So, it could be that this is already an indication, first indication that the economic cycle is slowing uh, due to all inflationary pressures. Uh, it could also be that the market is seeing the changes of what's happening, for example, in China. This big integrated pet and refining complexes have started up over the last couple of years, are still starting up, uh, and they produce their own feedstock for their packing operations. And therefore, they themselves or other players that are crowded out by these big Chinese, Chinese companies. Are needing less NAFTA. Yeah, so I'm not saying this is necessarily the case, but it's something to keep an eye on. Now, what is uh, very interesting is and very important in the market is that we are not only tight in terms of spare capacity on the upstream side, but also on the downstream side. Um, and um, where can this be concluded from? I mean, the, let, let me start with one of the reasons. One of the reasons is China. So we see in the blue bars here the diesel exports out of China. And you can see they have basically come nearly to a standstill, a loss of something like 500,000 barrels per day uh, compared to the high point. That is really a lot for, for a refined product. Um, and what you can see here in the, in the blue bars, uh, sorry, in the yellow bars, is that India has essentially come in and started to supply the regional market, the, the Asian market, instead uh, of China. And uh, that meant that they have sent much less to the Atlantic Basin market. Yeah, so this is how basically development in China has been a knock-on effect on the European market or on the Atlantic Basin market as well. The other interesting observation in this context is we can see here that Japanese transportation fuel exports have reached uh, a very high level in the first two months of this year. Uh, and that is uh, a strong indication as well that the capacity the system is evaporating. Japan is one of the, or the basically the most typical market for this spare capacity. Um, and <clears throat> the fact that they are running now very high and they're exporting products in, 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 in basically instead of China is uh, a good indication that we're running or we are basically yeah, moving close to the typical upper end of the refining uh, operational level globally. What I do want to say, however, is that the difference to the upstream industry, you can always get a little bit more out of refining. Yeah, the global refining industry is very flexible, there is always a little bit of spare capacity. There is, for example, evidently a lot of spare capacity in China. And if uh, cracks or margins were to increase a lot, then probably the Chinese government would change its stance 
uh, that it currently holds it is basically supplying only the domestic market and not exporting for yeah, partly environmental reasons and some other uh, aspects. So there is always a little bit more you can get from refining. Uh, a quick comment on gasoline. We see here two things on the left-hand chart. We see that in January, there has been a huge decline in US gasoline exports. Uh, that has initiated the current gasoline rally. Uh, it has also initiated a strong response from Europe. So that is the red line. European exports of gasoline have been extremely strong in February so far. So we see here nicely how basically one uh, development in the market, outages in the US refining system, lack of exports, triggers a price response and very fast uh, within one month triggers the supply response in this case from the European refining system. On the right hand chart, we see that there is a typical seasonality uh, flip flop, so to say, between uh, the Atlantic base in the US with the summer driving season and the Asian market, which essentially has a type of winter driving season from our perspective. That's partly driven by those summer driving season there as well, Australia and so on in the southern hemisphere. Um, so we see right now an extremely strong, uh, how to say, uh, imports into the into Asian markets, uh, into um, uh, Pacific Basin markets, and therefore basically with the gasoline market is really showing a double strength, both from the US and from the, the Asian market, and even the point of the season where we are, and uh, yeah, um, so basically slowly moving into the summer driving season, I think gasoline is a, a solid bet for further strength down the line. For diesel, the story is a little bit different. Diesel has been extremely hot product just a couple of weeks ago, or perhaps still yeah, more or less until now. Uh, but the outlook may be more mixed. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that there's been a lot of volatility in the diesel market. So last year, we had a lot of diesel demand, essentially, in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, and we had a very disappointing development in Asia as uh, COVID waves hit that market. Uh, then we had uh, extremely strong end to last year that was leading to this very strong cracks in November. Then a complete crash basically in the market in January, and now it looks to be picking up again. And um, yeah, it would be a little bit too much detail, but we see here on the right hand chart, currently the Americas are very strong pull factors. Uh, Europe is receiving very little diesel, and that has partly contributed to the strength. Uh, and the reason Europe is receiving very little diesel is again related to the China story from before, very limited diesel exports out of China. Uh, and we see here in the blue bars, this is basically Asian product exports on MR and LR tankers, so big clean tankers, uh, towards the Atlantic Basin. And you can see how this has come down. Uh, While the supplies to the uh, local markets uh, have uh, kept very high. So this is where basically the link uh, to the refining industry comes in um, and um, sorry, to the shipping industry comes in. Uh, so we see here how ton miles are coming down. Um, and yeah, from the shipping industry's perspective, uh, the unfortunate simple message is that all this strength in the oil market does not mean that there is strength for the shipping markets as well. Why? Because the strength in the oil market, price strength comes from a lack of supply and the lack of supply evidently is not good. Uh, for the people shipping all around the world. And the other thing that comes in and uh, that has what I wanted to show with this chart a little bit is, it looks like that in this very tight market environment, there is also a localization of supply. So basically the diesel supply stays in Asia rather than moving all the way to the Atlantic Basin. Uh, the Atlantic Basin itself struggles to meet its own demand. Um, and uh, therefore it's basically there, there is simply no big surplus producer right now in the world somewhere that sends a lot of oil a long way. Yeah? And this is why um, the ton mile demand for the different tanker segments are not developing particularly healthily, especially in the more recent past. So we see here on the right hand chart, clean product ton mile demand that has been up over parts of last year, most parts of last year for the uh, MR and LR tankers. Uh, what plays into that is uh, refining shutdowns in, in countries like Australia. So instead of producing its own products, Australia is now importing essentially all the products and that is a relative long distance. So on the clean market, things are looking relatively okay. Uh, the red line shows you total export volumes and they're still not yet back. This is the zero line actually uh, to the 2019 level. So in terms of oil flows, we're still behind 2019 levels. And this is way more clear on the crude side. Uh, we can see here the ton mileage in 2000 versus 2019 uh, is still way lower, barely any improvement. 
Um, and apart from what I showed before that generally OPTEC is lacking with supply, uh, it's also very much the West, uh, the West Africa story. So West African oil supply has come down so strongly and West Africa is the long haul supplier in the world. West African crude has to flow a long distance, in most cases to Asia. Uh, and that is being replaced by Middle Eastern flows to Asia, which are shorter, uh, US flows to Europe, which are also relatively short. So the big hope for the dirty shipping segment is basically that US exports increase a lot. And a lot of these US exports go all the way to China or to Asia, uh, taking a lot of uh, shipping capacity. Final slide. Um, so apart from um, the demand side, which is not looking good for the shipping industry, we have also the supply side in the areas in the background, uh, left for, for the dirty segment and the right for the clean segment. A part of the problem is simply also that so many ships have come into the market over the last couple of years. The fleet is growing, growing, growing. Yeah? Uh, and actually the ton mileage that is required is rather falling than growing or at least stagnant. Uh, and that is the key reason why freight rates illustrated here the basket uh, uh, rates uh, for crude on the left hand side and for clean products on the right hand side. Yeah, has gone up a little bit, but it's not really moving much. Yeah, so uh, all together, uh, we have simply this picture of uh, a very tight crude market. I would say very, very tight crude market. I personally think $150 per barrel is definitely possible over the next couple of months, first half of this year. Um, a very tight, perhaps not as tight, a little bit more flexibility refining industry. There is also quite a lot of new refineries coming up in the second half of this year, potentially. Um, and unfortunately, basically a shipping market that has surplus capacity still. And while things are likely to improve this year, uh, they will not change altogether. Uh, and finally, a quick marketing comment. Um, we will have um, from next week onwards, a weekly briefings for our clients, 15 minutes with nice slides as just presented. One in the Singapore window is one in the European window. Uh, hopefully, uh, can welcome some of you. Many thanks. Yeah, I think we have time for any quick questions or comments. Yeah, yeah, I'm not the absolute expert, but I have been briefed well by my colleagues. <laughs> um, so if I, you correct me if I say something wrong. <laughs> oh, you want to say <laughs> Uh, so yeah, just uh, to answer your question, I'll try at least. Uh, I think that we will uh, hopefully see uh, more tankers being scrapped. As you say, we've seen like lower order book to fleet ratio. And uh, we're also seeing that there is not uh, a lot of yard capacity available for tankers. So this is positive uh, for the tanking industry going forward. But in order to see uh, higher scrapping activity, uh, we, we need to see uh, some factors like the removal of sanctions from the US to Iran to take place, which will be quite a contributing factor. Thank you. Yeah, and for this year, uh, there is still a lot of tankers to come. So yes, uh, exactly. Also for, year, for, for, year, for next year. Yeah. So this lack of tanker uh, of, of uh, uh, space is rather something down the couple of from years. From 2023 and onwards. So yeah. for 2022, we're going to see a uh, higher delivery year in year. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? One or two more questions. We have room if there is one. Otherwise, All right. thank you so much, David. Round of applause once again for our fantastic presenter. I wish I had some jokes, but I don't. So, um, next up, we have our panel. I'm a one man band today. Sorry. with our esteemed guest today, who is Mark Jackson from the Baltic Exchange. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, alongside our illustrious CEO, Fabio Kuhn, and moderated by our lead freight specialist, shipping specialist, sorry, Sebastian Press. So everyone give a round of applause for our very esteemed industry leading panel. Yeah, just press and hold and it should be on. 
we all connected. Okay. <laughs> I'll speak loudly if not. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabio and Mark, for, for joining us. And thank you, David, for providing, as usual, the story and the context behind all the uh, data. Uh, Mark uh, is the, uh, the CEO of the Baltic Exchange, which is one of the leading uh, providers of uh, indices um, across the bulk industry with over 3,000 uh, members. Mark was also has been the chairman since, I think, 2009? Uh, I was chairman and then I was kicked out. And then came back. And then came back. Yes. As CEO. As CEO. <laughs> uh, and was also uh, head of the uh, non-cost uh, shipping here in, in London for, for 20 years, I think. Yeah. That. yeah. Uh, and Fabio, who is our CEO and founder, uh, he has was head of BP's uh, front-end uh, technology and innovation program, and before that with Uniper in a similar role, and then... Uh, a, a, a quant trader for statistical arbitrage, which is not something I know much about. But... <laughs> um, so I thought we'd uh, start perhaps uh, with a with an introduction. Uh, Mark, uh, in, in December, Voltexa and uh, and the Baltic Exchange signed a, an agreement, uh, a partnership for 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 for, for working with, together. And I wondered what your thoughts were on the collaboration with companies such as Vortex and what it means uh, to, to, to the Baltic Exchange. Yeah, the, um, so we, we call, I mean, we, I've just said, I use the term channel partner, um, which, which really sort of, you know, encapsulates how we look at sort of saying this is a channel to get the data out there. I mean, from the Baltics perspective, one of the things that we want is for our data to be used by everybody and, and therefore tying up with companies like Vortexa um, actually enhances our data. So rather than it just being just sending the data for somebody to look and, and try and work out how they're going to use their data into trading patterns or even risk management, when you tie up with other companies that have very large data sets, the addition of the Baltic data to that actually comes out as, a, a, if you want, more than the sum itself. Because Baltic data is actually quite simple. You know, we rely upon our panelists who are exposed to a, a big amount of data. They filter it down. So we end up with very clean data, which can be aggregated with other data itself. So, so for us now, channel partners are a key element. Now people are aware that they can actually use data in a multi, in multiple of ways, not just risk management or not just hedging. So it's a, it's a natural area for us, really, um, to tie up with channel partners. Fabio, you know, we're a much younger company. How, how, how does it mean to have a, a relationship with an organization like the Baltic? Yeah, so, so what we see an opportunity to bring together um, a, a, a complete set of actionable data, right? So, so from supply and demand balance, particularly on freight to, to the prices, we're getting really close to how traders make and charters make their decisions. And, and so having it all together and, and linking those uh, data sets in a way that people can make better decisions faster. Uh, I think it's, it's been our goal of, you know, working with Baltic and, and the market has, has you know, uh, responded really well to that. There's a lot more to come. Uh, I think uh, the trend of data getting faster and more and more actionable is, is a long lived, you know, trend. And so um, limited by, of course, how far you can take technology and how, how fast we can actually process all of this is what's going to be defining a lot of what's ahead but this it's clear for us it's a, a very exciting path ahead of you know going further into the future further into actionable insight yeah. i think sorry just to jump in yeah. i think there's another area as well in the fact that you know there are many companies trying to layer if you want insights into the market and and we always try and sort of say look if we're a base data set that people can trust then once companies are trying to compare themselves with each other, it almost doesn't question. They go, well, there's Baltic data underlying in terms of the freight, right, I'm happy with that, I don't have to question it. And then they start moving into what's that company bringing to the table. And, and if you want, it levels the playing field between your competitors and other people as well. So, so we feel that it's helping those decisions to allow, you know, allows people, it gets rid of if you have some of the mystique that's in there or, or the, they want to have trust in one area of it and you can move on to the other bit, which is actually the interesting bit yeah. to, to work out what you're going to do. What, what you say is very interesting because there is a, a, the differentiation end up becoming more and more. We see, we saw that the energy was seen that definitely in freight is the, the differentiation in the market started becoming for, 
those who are able to process information understand the you know what's going on with data faster than their competitors in the market and, and we see already how that's play out in a, in a big way in the market and and it is a, a you know again another long long trend as in uh, traders, charters, analysts were able to deal with more more data, more analytics. They are having an increasing edge uh, in, in the market. Yeah, I mean, we've heard from David just now. You know the the, the challenges that are facing the shipping industry. You know, normally when you have uh, high high uh, oil demand, it is pushing up the freight rates. There's a demand for tankers, but that's not happening now. And and there are a lot of other pressures for, for ship owners and uh, with. Uh, regulations and, and so on. What are sort of Baltic members saying to, to you, Mark, with regards to that, how they're how they going to deal with it? I think there's, I've, I've got an answer for that, but I might yeah. go back a little bit in terms of what I, one of the things that clicked to me today when I was looking at the presentation was the fact that, you know, we've been looking at some of the ships and we're thinking, why are they going so fast? And, they, and, and you know, why are they going fast on the laden leg? You know, because it doesn't actually make commercial sense from the owner's perspective. I mean, here's the owner trying to reduce his carbon footprint and everything else. But actually, if you're sort of saying, do you know what? There isn't enough oil coming out of the ground. There's a just-in-time thing happening. They need the ships to get there to actually to actually supply the, the fuel um, to the destination. So they're making the ships go quicker. Yeah. And some of the things that that's some of the areas that we can provide a little bit of transparency on because we're starting to see you know we're starting to see that level of detail on the pricing when when our assessors are talking to the panelists and they're going oh you know what what's going on here um those sort of things join the dots but i mean generally we i mean the baltic never wants never goes into the situation we're never trying to forecast we're, we're always backward looking you know we've got big data set going backwards i think that when the markets when the markets are very low other things come into play you know many owners it's all about surviving for the next speak it's such a cyclical business and from and looking at it from an owner's perspective rather than let's say from a charter's perspective is about how do you reduce costs you know and so that's let's say why we produce an opex you know the operating cost index you know again it's another reference point it's about it's about trying to see how can an owner survive to the next to the next peak um and, and trying to provide those relationships and sort of saying a basic thing, you know, how much is an owner earning? How much is the ship costing? A bit of transparency, something's going to break at some point, you know, so those are simple, those are sort of simple data measures that then you overlay with, with the type of analyst information that's coming along and saying, at some point, the owner's just going to stop, you know, when, where is that breaking point coming along? It's more than just a question of sort of riding out the storm, do you think, or, or uh, is it something? Well, I think I think in, I think it is. There is an element of riding out the storm, uh, and obviously the ones that the ones that can afford <laughs> that can afford it. That's a simple way of doing it. Other people have to come up with strategies of how they're going to do it, and then it's a mixture of hedging, risk mitigation. It's you know, it's a, it's about looking at how you can reduce your costs, and that's where things come onto the line. You know, in terms of at what point. Are you operating that vessel just at the edge, you know, or, and are you in regulation or not? Now, the tanker market is a lot better at doing this than this, so the dry cargo side of things. Um, but we're, we're airing into a different territory <laughs> up here, I think. I mean, Fabio, I mean, when, you, when the charter is looking at the market now, they see this huge supply of, of tonnage available. I mean, how does a, a platform like Fortex are providing sort of analytical insights Give them give them an answer or yeah the thing even let's say step back from from this particular case like if you if you just look at the amount of volatility in the market right so that we have experienced in the last couple of years because of you know covid uh and what we are seeing now forward which you know david uh, outlined here so so well um is that there's a lot more volatility ahead right because the the world is now in a way readjusting on coming back you know, from 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 COVID and all the investments that were not made before, they haven't been made. And so the a lot of what we're seeing is the supply crunch that is ahead of us is still in a larger structural form, a rebalancing of the market. And so when you have this kind of volatility in and then now out of COVID, you, you have a, a, an immense amount of um, uh, opportunities for those who can call the market the right way. Like in a, in a stable market, it doesn't matter if you if you, if you call the market right or wrong, things are not moving, you don't make uh, any profits, you don't make better decisions or positioning the vessels or taking you know, different uh, strategies in the market. 
with volatility, no, it really separates those who uh, can understand and call the market the right, the right way. And so um, with that comes then information and having access to the right information uh, you know, at, at the right time, at the right speed, allow them better decisions to capture that volatility that exists. Actually, I said yeah. one of the things you asked was sort of about the challenge, let's say, of in low markets. And I think it is a challenge. And I think that's one of the, if you want, one of the fundamental reasons why the Baltic uses a panelist a broker network to, to price the indices is because, you know, you've got volatility going on, which is, which is you know, in higher markets, volatility tends to transfer or result in, in higher trading profits. But volatility in low markets, you know, there are tiny margins. And, but it also is in shipping, it's almost like a bunch of sheep, you know, everybody's on one side of the fence. And once the market starts going up, they're all on the other side of the fence. And, you know, you, you can't, you know, everybody's a buyer and nobody's a seller. And, and in those sort of markets, you know, when you see fixtures going on, the charters suddenly want to fix all the ships and the owners all want to wait. And so we're very reliant upon our panelists to be able to tell us what's actually going on. What are the prices that are being talked about? And so we can't rely upon a transaction every single day. And I think that's one of the fundamental things about our market. You know, there are only X number of ships. And even if it's two times the volume of the physical ships, you've still got to be able to price that underlying market. So, so in the lower markets, we become very reliant upon our panelist network. And that means there's a lot of pressure on our assessors to make sure that they're aware of what's going on in the market as well. Um, so the fact that, you know, key conversations can happen between the two of them. So it does become harder. High markets, lots of volume going through, you know, good volatility, everybody's happy. But yeah, the pressure is on everybody, ship owners, charterers, you know, in low markets when you get these sort of squeezes. Yeah, I mean, the, the Baltic's been around for a, a long time in this sort of our world, like our <laughs> bond, you know, and, and, and it's, it's coming back to that, that, that now a little bit in this kind of Yeah, I, I think, you know, 276. I mean, it's, I sort of sometimes think we'll just cap it at 300. But, but you know, the, the Baltic's been providing, if you want, a venue or price discovery for that for that period of time. We still have the word exchange in our name, although we don't necessarily have a physical floor anymore. You know, but we're still providing price transparency, and that's what you know the Baltic's been doing for a long for a long time, along with setting rules for a marketplace. I mean, we're still trying to pick up pitch ourselves as being you know, the, the sort of self-regulating regulator in an unregulated marketplace. You know, that's why we want people to sign up to the code and things like this. Um, but that's maybe a different different topic altogether. <laughs> the shipping industry is quite traditional. And I know Fabio, when Vortex has started out, it, it, was, it was working primarily a lot with the trading side. And are you seeing the similar kind of challenges with uh, the shipping industry, with people becoming more ready to accept using data and, and uh, to, to, to make their decisions and become more reliant on it in, in terms of analysis? Yeah, and it's a, it's a really good question. So it goes to a question about change overall, right? And, and the, the question about change is also important to that things are the way they are for good reasons, right? They have evolved over people experiencing different ways of doing things and settling some things that work. So uh, change for change's sake is not good, right? So it's because we already live through a lot to get there. Um, the change is worthwhile when it's changed for something that is truly better, uh, truly give you an edge. And I think the best answer to those in markets tends to be, uh, you know, higher profits, better decisions, outcomes. And, and that's where we really see the, the driver of changes based on, you know, kind of real uh, decisions, you know, real outcomes. And, and I think that's what we, we saw when we uh, went, you know, with our energy products and our freight, we see a similar sort of paradigm shift, you know, of, but it needs to be useful. Like th there's no time to be wasted in this market, right? Nobody goes to a screen if they're not getting something from it. That's very clear. Change for us is, a, is one of those, it, we've got this piece whereby, you know, we take on and start pricing an index and we come from a, a history of sort of saying, right, once you've done that, it's there forever sort of thing. So when we pick one, we've got to make sure that we think that it's going to have longevity. However, we, you know, in the last five years, we are changing. We are trying to become a little bit more nimble. We have to be because the way that people can adopt data and, and even, you know, people are testing different trading patterns now. You can see something come up and then stop or slow down. Um, so we've got to be able to react to that. Um, we've got to be able to react to that. But, you know, we've been doing it in one way for a very long period of time. 
So it takes us a little bit more to, we're a little bit slower at changing, but we have got a lot quicker. We have got a lot quicker. Well, at least I think we have. <laughs> Yeah, partnerships allow us to exactly. Perfect. <laughs> yes, it's not a generational good thing. Good save. <laughs> um, we nearly veered into the uh, into the subject of emissions earlier, but um, you know it's it's a subject on everyone's sort of, uh, tongue a little bit. Um, you know, the the shipping industry has has had a lot. It, it's been thrown a lot with the with the emissions. There's a lot of uncertain a lot of uncertainty. Do you see, Mark, a change in the relationship between owner and charterer having, you know, having to share a lot more data around their emissions? Um, you know, a lot of big oil majors and trading companies have their own fleets. Do, do you think there's, there's a potential structural change in the, in the industry? I don't, I actually don't think there's a big structural change because, you know, already there was, you know, there was a lot of sharing of the, you know, the actual performance of the vessel. It's all linked down to the performance of the vessel. I think, I think the difficult waters that we're navigating at the moment is that you've got, you know, we're in this area of whereby there is no golden bullet to solve the problem. We're in a voluntary market whereby people are trying to demonstrate what they're doing. You can see regulation coming towards you, but, you know, you're having to do lots of small things to try and make a difference. And a lot of people maybe discount those small things. And I think that it, there's an importance to concentrate on them because those are the things you can do at this point in time. Um, from the Baltics perspective, I think it's a bit like a, I, I sort of reference back to sort of saying, you know, we want to just have a base layer of data that everybody goes, well, there's a bit of, you know, a basic data you can trust. I mean, we're, we've done it on the dry. We're very close to bringing it out on the tanker side of things, which is we're just going to come out and give some EEOI scores on every route. Why? Because there's a lot of conversation about saying, well, should this be physical reporting? Should this be based upon AIS calculations, whether that's for, for you know, your, let's just stick on EEOI at the moment, the you know, amount of carbon, the amount of work, and, and whether there's just an assumption. And, and our feeling is from our discussions is that really the, the percentage difference between all of those is very small. And so all we want to be able to do is demonstrate to people, look, stop worrying about how you're calculating this, just calculate it your way, because actually they're all within, call it 5% of each other. That is the starting point. We've got to make such a big difference that the 5% isn't going to make, you know, as long as you just agree and that's your starting point. So we're going to try and come out with some sort of clarity in terms of the discussion itself, just to aid the discussion. We're not trying to come up with any sort of indices or something that people are going to necessarily benchmark. Those are out there already, and it's voluntary whether people are going to go into them or not. So I think, I think what's changing is the way that people talk about it. Because the first time, we're no longer talking about something that's just maritime. You know, it's the same problem on the land. You know, they've got the same problem. You're going to be competing for almost the same fuel. Are you going to be both competing for ammonia or hydrogen, most probably, more likely? You know, these are the sort of things. So that what you want is both industries to be talking about the same thing, and then you know you're all walking in the same direction. Um, not sure if that was yeah. quite what you asked. <laughs> I mean, Fabi. I mean, how do you see the the way the world is going to change how it's trading energy? Um... Yeah, and also what what we see already happening with our clients, which is which is fascinating change to see, is that um, decisions now are being made or going the direction of being made in many cases, um, taking into consideration the carbon footprint of a trade, right? So. Um, there's not a, a, a good consistent way to do that at scale yet, but you can see that that is where the market is going to go, right? So before doing uh, a trade, before charting a vessel, you, tr you would try to be anticipating the, the footprint of that trade versus another trade versus another ship. Um, and, and using that footprint you know, as part of the calculation. When, when uh, uh, some of the large players declare this net zero, in practice inside those companies are creating a budget for, for carbon. That is allocated, that is managed, that you know, that filters down to a trade or a charter um, at some point. And so, when they're making the decisions, the choice uh, is more and more factoring a carbon footprint into, into the trade, which I think is a is a, a, a gr really great way, right, to solve the problem uh, or or realize some of the impact that that can be achieved uh, by optimizing the assets in a in a better way. 
uh, and the opportunity is big, right? I mean, uh, the the opportunity to actually reduce the carbon footprint in shipping is is, is massive. We all know ships move too fast and arrive too early, yeah. uh, on average, uh, by a big amount. And so, if we're able then to factor uh, this carbon footprint in into the the trade more closely, we'll start recouping by market forces that uh, you know uh, efficiency to the world. I have to agree. You know, that's one of the things that's come out. You know, by you know, as soon as you start doing these sort of, you know, your carbon footprint or the, the you know, the EI score by route, you can suddenly go, well, hang on, that route itself has a lower EI score than that, that route. You know, as an owner, you could possibly optimize your one by just trading that one if it's if your ship is the right one. That means a charter that that possibly is competing with a route that has a higher carbon footprint, maybe we'll have to pay more, you know, now. That doesn't necessarily feed the money back into the system, but but it starts putting pressure on change. I think that's one of the I think that's one of the things that is highlighting is the fact that you can look at the way that you're trading, look at the way that you're trading a vessel as much as anything else. Um, I guess you're having to consider the the ballast leg, which is something that's not really been done before. We we include the ballast leg. Yeah, we we definitely mm -hmm. include the ballast leg in all in all of that. Um, but but you know, I mean, even with we've got ICSI coming, you know, I, I think one of the biggest if you, people compare this to sulfur, to the to the to the sulfur side of things, I mean, from us as the Baltic, we've got to look at the impact to our indices, and saying, you know, what's going to happen? Are the ships going to have to slow down because of power ratings? This sort of thing. The good thing about the sulfur side of things was it happened to everybody on the same day. And what people are only just really realizing is that fact that ICSI is all about your certificate. When does your certificate come up for renewal? And, you know, we're starting to hear people who are trying to renew their certificates now, this year, earlier, so the fact that they can delay when it actually counts next year. So there's potential at the moment for, if you want, calling gaming the system, but there's, there's flexibility in the system. It's not going to be a level playing field across the board, just like that first sulfur cap. Now, they have to register technically, they have to be making their statements, um, but how does that impact our indices in the first year? That's one of the discussions that's going on. But there is uncertainty. All of this is uncertainty going forward. If you're trading an FFA out for three years on the tanker side of things, it's voyage. Is the carbon cost going to be in that freight rate? Is it not going to be in the freight rate? You know, um, yeah, these are the things that we're, we're hoping to, to come out with this year. But yeah, it's, it's a big, big question. It is a big question. There's, yeah. no, there's no answer. So I'm going to put you both on the, on the spot. Uh, I was listening to the... Uh, the um, the uh, Baltic webinar earlier today, and uh, they were talking about the different choices of fuels that are potentially <laughs> available. So, uh, which one would you choose, Mark, uh, oh. for a fuel of the future? Fuel of the future. I've just come back from holiday. I think kite would be very nice. You know, I've been Windy kite boarding quite okay. nicely, but I think, yeah, I don't. I think, I think I'd go back to what I said earlier, which was, you know, the, the fuel side of things. You know, we're waiting. We're waiting for the magic bullets on the on that. You know, hydrogen at the moment seems to have a little bit of a, a you know an advantage because there are engines out there that are going down the hydrogen route. In terms of commercially, ammonia is still way behind on that side of things. Um, so I say concentrate on the small things at the moment. Look at your trading patterns. You know, look what you can do. Hull coatings, how you're operating the vessel. But you know, really speed. And then we come back to how we opened, you know, yeah. they need the cargo there, you know, but technically you need more ships. You know, if you're going slower, you need more ships. So and maybe they're coming. Yeah. I don't think so. Not from what we've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Not anytime soon. No. How about you? Would you pick what? What would you pick? Yeah, I think I think to pick now is 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 really hard because there, there isn't a really a good solution, right? That scales really well in a you know in a in a in a, in a global uh, you know trade and and compared to what is required right for the industry so um no question the biggest contribution is in basically running uh the system better right running the, the planet the the freight you know uh part of the equation better um, and so that that naturally will um means you know slower speed more demand for for mm -hmm. freight once once emissions start playing a key part of of, of the trade it's still not yet right and and so I think that is something that will be, you know, seen more and more. If you combine that with some of the the, the previous question, you know, on, on on the freight kind of, um, uh, you know, supply in the long term, 
you know, perhaps some optimistic, uh, you know, freight long-term uh, predictions can come. But, um, but I think it is important that um, that that we do that, right? Because the what is I think what is what is at stake is is quite a big uh, amount of uh, efficiency that can be bringing to the system. Uh, but in terms of fuel, it is a longer term problem uh, choice, right? Because ba ba batteries are no nowhere near, uh, you know, the ships and, and uh, hydrogen is still very early on, like to achieve the scale of, you know, it's promising, but it's yeah, still early, mixed, right? you know, yeah. methane injection. Or yeah. I think one of the things I would say is, you know, watch the short sea market. That's where things are going to get tested, you know, because it's not out in the middle of nowhere. Um, they're the ones that are going to have a you know, better risk profile to, to, well, yeah, that's where, and, and, you know, and it's the first movers are, are the mad ones. Um, and we need mad people at the moment. Yeah. I think that's really <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much both uh, for your time. Um, I'm going to open to uh, the floor for any questions to, to Fabio or Mark. Hello there. I'm just a, uh, I'm the NAFTA reporter with Argus, so I don't really know uh, too much about shipping. But um, just by way of a mad idea, do you think it could ever be possible to have uh, nuclear powered tankers since that's uh, an efficient fuel? Or do you think it would simply be too mad? That's the question. I, so I've been involved in a few conversations that where this is where this has come up. And I think, you know, under the new salt reactors, you know, there is, it is a possibility that it is being looked at. I think, I think one of the things that was highlighted was, was linking hydrogen with nuclear power stations, because nuclear power stations themselves, even, you know, modern ones at the moment, they have to run 100% of the time. And even then, they only just break even, you know, because it costs so much to build these things and because of the legacy side of it. So the idea that you can you can put you should be going down putting nuclear power onto the vessels, it seems to me you know why not just put nuclear power stations into making the hydrogen or the or the ammonia side of things and making it a much more universal piece for the vessels. I think I think nuclear on board vessel is a, is it, it's as it's as possible as hydrogen and ammonia. I think that you've got a fear regulatory fear and and a people fear about nuclear vessels coming to the shore. So. So I think certain types of vessel might it might work for that are providing the operations, the loading, discharging operations offshore, which has just reminded me one of the things I wanted to say about the carbon side of things about, you know, the biggest difference that we've seen between tankers and dry is the fact that dry sits with they manage to put the carbon footprint of the loading and discharging operations onto the land, onto the port most of the time. But the ships themselves are the ones that are carrying it. You know, we're looking at some of these short durations, you know, let's say clean cross med, 40% of the, the carbon footprint is coming from the port operation itself. You know, whereas on the dry side of things, that's all taken on land. And, and so tankers has really got a pretty, pretty hard, pretty hard role compared to other elements of shipping as well, because they perform those operations, plus heating the cargo and mm. down. I just suddenly remember what you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, uh, aircraft carriers use nuclear uh, fuel, you know, and it, you just need to uh, refuel them uh, 50, 60 years, uh, you know, periods. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very powerful, but then the regulation and all of that is, is going to be hard. Any other questions? Yeah, can I get a drink? Yeah, then? You may. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's time to to go to the next part of the event. Oh, yeah, I can't say no to that, can I? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there were some very good insights of the industry and reflections at all. Um, yes, I'll open up the bar now to everybody. Thank you so much once for attending. Um, please, food and drinks will start pretty soon. Um, but yes, thank you for joining us for our IOE Week 2022. <laughs>